Welcome back, everyone. Um, so today we have uh, Elizabeth K. Joseph, who's going to tell us about the opening open sourcing of infrastructure. Please make Elizabeth feel welcome. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, so this talk is going to be um, a bit of a history lesson, um, and then going to give you some tips as we enter into um, uh, the modern day with proprietary software as it is today, um, and how you might want to avoid it. So um, a little bit about my background. Um, I've been working in open source software communities for about 15 years. Um, I started on the east coast of the US where I was living, went to a bunch of Linux users groups, um, ran my own servers, and had lots of fun playing around um, with open source software. Um, made my first patch to an open source software project in like 2004, 2005. Um, and it was something I just really enjoyed doing. So eventually I got a job doing uh, Linux and systems administration about 11 years ago. Um, right now, um, I'm at a company called Mesosphere. Um, we, do, um, we, we do most of the development on a piece of software called Apache Mesos, which you might be familiar with. And then another project on top of that called DCOS, which does a lot of the container orchestration um, to make things a lot easier. Um, one of the things I like to say about working at Mesosphere is that I joined Mesosphere because I believe in open source infrastructure, uh, not the other way around. So even though I'm a developer advocate advocating this sort of infrastructure stuff, um, it's because I actually believe in it, not because I happen to have a job doing this stuff. <laughs> um, I've also worked on a couple of books. Um, I worked on a couple of editions of the official Ubuntu book. Um, and then while I was working on OpenStack for HP, I wrote a book um, called Common OpenStack Deployments. That's totally out of date right now because uh, OpenStack is released, it's supported for about a year, and it takes about five months for a book to hit the shelves. So it was like, it was like half done by the time it went. So I'm never doing that again. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I've, I've gotten pretty deep into this infrastructure stuff in the past uh, 15, 10 to 15 years. So I'm gonna tell you a story, um, and, it, and it, is, it is mostly true, but at least it's from my perspective. So I'm looking back at infrastructure since I started working on Linux and playing around with it, say, like 1998 or so. So the past 20 years of me dabbling in the Linux world and in infrastructure stuff that got me interested. So this story is a very opinionated view of how infrastructure has evolved over the past 20 years. Um, and I've talked to a bunch of people about this, and I, I tend to be around like-minded folks at these Linux conferences, and afterwards everyone's like, I did that too. So hopefully this will be fun. <laughs> so. We're talking like 1998, I'm in high school and I'm playing around with computers because I'm a lonely kid. <laughs> I still kind of am. <laughs> um, but when, you know, I, I, you know, I what didn't have really strong, like, I didn't have a lot of access to the internet, but I was like, I like computers, I'm playing in the library, I finally get a computer at home and I'm like, I wanna make a server. How do you do that? Okay. So back then, you um, grab some version of Solaris if you can get that super cheap, or you grab Windows NT. Um, so the first time I launched Windows NT, I put it on the internet and immediately got uh, a virus because um, you're supposed to update it first. <laughs> um, but that's, that's neither here nor there. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. But at this time, the idea was that when you want to make a server, you use one of these proprietary technologies. Linux was not on my radar. I had no idea what it was. Um, if I had heard of it, I probably thought it was some strange hacker thing that was not for me. And so this is kind of this era of proprietary software. When you want software, you go to a store and you get it off the shelf. So this was in, I think, 2000, yeah, mid-2000s. There's Ubuntu on a shelf in a computer store in the US. That was pretty exciting because I was working on Ubuntu at the time. And I'm like, oh, there we are in the shop, just like all the rest of the software. Um, but this is how you got software. Um, you weren't downloading it. The bandwidth speeds weren't great. It weren't good enough to download a lot of software. Um, and that's just how, you know, my mom bought me software for Christmas and she went to a store. Um, and Linux at the time was sort of this upstart. Um, what I noticed at the time is like a lot of companies who were investing in it, at best, they sort of saw it as this cheap Unix. Um, it wasn't really this good thing on its own, but you could toss it on um, servers and start using it as a cheap replacement for their customers. Um, there was all, also a lot of this fear, uncertainty, and doubt around open source software. Um, this is around the time, this is around 2000, um, I guess 2002 maybe, um, when I started getting involved with Linux users groups. Um, and Microsoft did this um, so total cost of ownership study 
where they showed that Linux was way too expensive. And you should just go with Microsoft because the admins are cheaper and it's too hard to run Linux. And I'm in this Linux users group and we're like, oh, it's not that bad. <laughs> Um, also, you should hire us. <laughs> um, and then also, uh, you know, this, this uh, documentary, I don't know how many are familiar with Revolution OS. Okay. So it's a, it's a documentary that goes through some of the luminaries of the open source world, you know, through the 80s and 90s. And honestly, this documentary did us no favors. <laughs> I mean, I was in a lug, and we had viewing parties, and I was totally into it, and I was like, oh, boom, Microsoft and stuff. But looking back at this, now that I've worked at big companies like HP and I'm at a startup that services a lot of enterprise customers, I'm looking at the jacket of this DVD here and I'm seeing like Microsoft with like the dollar signs and the X through it. And if you can read it on there, it says, hackers, programmers, and rebels unite. Okay, to 22-year-old me, that was fine. <laughs> but I'm looking back at this and being like, oh gosh. <laughs> Um, we, we could have been better with our, with our messaging um, at that point because we're trying to be serious about Linux and trying to bring it to the mainstream. And that's not the message that we were sending. Um, but I liked it anyway. Like, I was really into this Linux thing. It seemed like a lot of fun. Um, one of the things I really liked was when I first set up my desktop, I was using the Enlightenment desktop environment because you didn't need any icons or anything on the desktop. It was just the, the desktop. Um, and then I started playing around with widgets and writing patches, um, really bad patches, because I don't actually know C, but if you change enough things, like it'll make do stuff that you want it to do. <laughs> um, but I, I didn't know what I was doing. But I, I could customize my desktop to however I wanted it, and that was a really compelling thing for me. So um, after a couple of years, I, I go into this Linux users group. I met a lot of people through that, and I ended up getting a junior systems administrator job. Um, I was actually working full time doing like accounting temp work at the time, and then this guy at the lug was like, "Hey, you want to go rack some servers?" I'm like, "Yes!" He's like, "I'll give you money," and I'm like, "Oh yes!" <laughs> <laughs> so that was pretty exciting. So I got this junior sysadmin job. I was racking servers and like going in with like a CD of Debian right into a data center. Um, thankfully, my, my boss was kind of a small guy too, so even though I couldn't lift the server, like between the two of us, <laughs> we could get it up in there. Um, so I was working at this, this job. Um, it's on the east coast of the U US in Philadelphia. Philadelphia is not really known for having a really vibrant tech scene, um, at least not at the time. So we were approaching customers at the, this, this um, company I was working at, and we decided to do an, a seminar about open source. And this is like 2004, 2005. And so some of the things we answered at this seminar were, first of all, what is free and open source software? Just the really basic stuff. Because again, we're e exiting this era of you go to a shelf and buy it, or you buy software from a vendor. Um, my boss gave a talk on how it can deliver business results. Um, and then like talking about like how all, there's all this software out there, how do you choose? And perhaps my favorite one of all, um, we were doing a lot of um, web applications, like hosting a lot of web applications at the company. And so we were used saying, you know, use open source web applications to produce business results. And this is my favorite one because this is what so many applications and like the entire land of Silicon Valley that I come from is based on now. Like everyone is using open source web apps to like and, and phone apps and everything to build their companies. So we were talking about this, you know, 15 years ago and trying to convince companies that open source was going to be the base for all this um, with, with some success. And I sort of see. Um, the turning point here, when companies actually started believing us, um, was sort of with the LAMP stack. Um, you finally had Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP, or whatever language you want to put in that last spot, <laughs> um, as a scalable, solid solution. So almost all of our customers um, were using some, some portions of the LAMP stack, um, and we were able to scale those out really easily. Um, and this is sort of where customers started believing us. And it's, I sort of see this as a trend in the entire industry as well. Startups started using the LAMP stack really extensively. Um, it's essentially what like, Twitter was built on in the really, really early days. Um, so this turning point was when everyone started understanding that, hey, this open source stuff can be real, it can be scalable, and it's not actually that hard, Microsoft. <laughs> hey, my slide is stuck. Well, now you have to look at my cat. So I took this picture. I was like, you're so bad. Oh, I have to take a picture. 
Okay. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> All right, let's see if this is. All right. So, you know, I started examining this because I was trying to figure out, like, what happened before we really started pushing the LAMP stack really hard. Um, and I, I noticed some things about the, the industry in general with the infrastructure. Um, I noticed that the change in our customers tended to be that they started being really reluctant to be locked in by a vendor. Um, we had one customer um, who had the foresight to actually ask for the source code for this accounting software they were essentially running their entire business on. And when that, that company went, went bankrupt, um, they, got, they got access to the source code. And suddenly, they were the only one in their industry of people who had the source code to the software that a whole bunch of other companies in their industry used. And we ended up bringing them out to a bunch of events and being like, you should tell your story. This is amazing. Um, because suddenly, they turned into a software company, it turns out. Because everyone was like, you have the source code? <laughs> Um, so this lock-in became a real threat, um, and people really started understanding that um, because technology had grown so much. So it wasn't only just the open source side, it was just so many companies, like insurance companies and banks were really getting into technology in a way they hadn't been before. Um, we also started seeing a greater concern over security. Um, there were several high-profile incidents um, with, with our customers where vendors were not disclosing security vulnerabilities until much later than they should have. Um, so they're, companies were vulnerable um, and they didn't really know what was going on. So we were pushing open source software as an option to try to mitigate that and show that there's a community behind this um, helping improve security. Um, we also had customers who wanted to add features and fix bugs and do things themselves. They wanted to hire us to fix things in the software because a lot of the companies we were working with were smaller companies and while they had the budget to pay us to add a little feature to something or host something special for them, um, the vendors that they, were, they had been previously dealing with weren't really um, listening to them at all. Um, we also started seeing, um, I don't know how many people are familiar with the term inner sourcing, sort of where you take open source method methodologies and apply them internally so that there's a shared code base and, and shared developments. Um, but this started emerging as a really good way to do software development. Oh, here we go again. <laughs> I'm just going to switch to the PDF in a second. <laughs> Um, so that's sort of how they interacted with it. And then also how, the, how um, they were using the software. Um, you know, it used to be that you would see downtime on websites. They'd just be like, we're down for maintenance. Um, now the only people who can get away with that are my bank, for some reason. I, <laughs> and I live on the, on, the, on the West Coast now, and that means that when I'm trying to do my banking at 11 o'clock on Saturday night, yeah, no, that's not happening. <laughs> Um, but, you know, most, most sites, they don't have downtime these days. Like, it's not really acceptable. It's not socially acceptable and, and like, business acceptable to have downtime on your website. Um, so that, that's something that started happening. Um, and then also there's, in, in, in concert with that, um, a lot of places are, are relying upon um, auto-scaling and automation to make sure that their systems are going to be working. Um, we spent a lot of time doing high availability solutions for our customers. And this started out really, like, really hackish, like we're using like virtual machines and heartbeat and pacemaker to just like fail over on two, physical mach two or three physical machines. Um, but that's really evolved over time. Um, at the time we were also still referring to our servers by names, like that one has the dodgy RAM, that one has the second power supply that doesn't work. Um, but you know, we're sort of evolving out of that um, over these past 10 years. Um, and then most recently, there's this larger focus on um, data, um, both retaining data and accessing it really fast. Um, if you look at any of the really big companies in Silicon Valley, they're essentially based, they're data companies. Like they collect data and they serve it to their customers. If you look at something like Uber, like that's just all data. It's just connecting people who need things with something, someone who has them. So I was reading this book actually, um, still reading it, I'm almost done. Um, but I really like this, this quote from, from Tim O'Reilly because I'm, I'm sort of like working my way through putting together this talk and I read this quote from him and I'm like, oh, I agree. But he's like, the seeds of the future were found in free software and the internet rather than these um, now establishment technologies offered by Microsoft. So this was a quote back early 2000s um, where he's saying like, the future is in the internet, it's in open source, it's not in all of these old um, proprietary things by Microsoft. Um, now I've said a few things about Microsoft during this talk, but they're changing. Um, I was at uh, uh, Elasticon 
the first conference that uh, the Elasticsearch community put on. And these were on all of our seats, these little USB sticks um, during the keynote. And so I get there and I'm like, what? <laughs> Um, and it, it was just so funny for me because, you know, in the beginning of my career, I was fighting against Microsoft and their total cost of ownership report. Um, and then suddenly I sit down and they're like, we love Linux. I'm like, all right. <laughs> this, is, this, is a, <laughs> this, is, this is definitely a new strange world that I'm living in. I actually gave this USB stick to a friend of mine who hates Microsoft. It was great. <laughs> Um, but I make all these jokes, but at the same time, um, this is a, a report that came out from uh, GitHub in 2016. Um, it's just a little over a year ago, actually. And you know, say what you will about this graph and what it means, um, but this is, this is showing you the organizations with the most open source contributors. Um, what this means is that there are people who are affiliated with these companies who have made contributions on GitHub. So that does not mean that Microsoft is the biggest contributor to open source, obviously. That could mean that these employees are just making one commit, or they're committing to something that's unrelated to software development, or it happens to be open source, but it's not actually a real, I mean, it, you wouldn't consider them um, like day-to-day -day open source contributors. But what this does tell me is that inside of Microsoft somewhere, there is a process where employees are being taught how to use GitHub. And that's really transformational for me. I was like, you know, all these other companies are in here doing it too, but of all the companies to be doing this, Microsoft has a process to get over 16,000 employees with some sort of credential on GitHub. So, you know, I'm, I'm a sysadmin, I'm an infrastructure person. So I'm looking at open source and I think it's this really awesome thing. I've been using a ton of open source, but I see developers are contributing to open source. They're sharing all of their coding and stuff. And what am I doing? I'm using it. Um, I'm developing my infrastructure um, using open source software. Um, but I'm looking at like, it's like 2009 and I left my operations job and I left all my tools behind. Like I had these awesome rsync scripts and like I had this like YAML thing to create Nagios configs <laughs> and it was all really great. But then I left my job and I left all that tooling behind. Um, at the time, we hadn't really been open sourcing our operations tools. Um, and it was something at my job I had always wanted to do because my boss was actually really open source friendly. Um, but it wasn't, there wasn't really an ecosystem out there for that. Um, this was like in the days of SourceForge and like people didn't just randomly put scripts up. Um, I did sometimes like put random things on my blog here and there. Um, but it wasn't like ops people putting stuff on GitHub like they do today. So that was, that was really sad times. Um, so we get into this phase, you know, continuing with our history lesson here, where the operations stuff starts getting open sourced. And this is really exciting for me. So this, this was done in a few ways. Um, you had like the basic configuration management movement where you've got all these puppet modules and chef cookbooks and you know, all you know, Ansible um, playbooks and what, whatnot. Um, so finally, I no longer have to tune my SQL myself because really I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I can use someone else's template for tuning MySQL and then say like, they're doing a pretty good job, they know what they're doing, so I can pretty, you know, I, I'm obviously gonna test it, but um, I no longer have to set up all the replication variables myself and figure out everything in MySQL. Um, you finally have these modules that someone else has written who's really smart. Um, you also th have things that are a bit broader than just configuration management, where you have like full service management. Um, I first interacted with this actually with uh, Canonical's like Juju Charms where they had like the default example of deploying WordPress. So it's like you deploy a web server over here, you deserve my MySQL server over here, and maybe a load balancer or whatnot. Um, but the idea is that you're no longer just deploying, a, or deploying or defining a single service on a single server. Um, you're now bringing multiple servers into this mix. Um, and then I work on Mesos now and we have this DCOS universe catalog and it's sort of the same thing. We're deploying something like Apache Spark across um, 15 containers um, and they all sort of know about each other and the orchestration understands what's going on. Um, but it's no longer just deploying to a single server and just being single server aware. Um, you're now deploying entire infrastructures. Um, and these are both op fully open source too, which is really exciting because now everyone knows how to start deploying these really complicated services. Um, and today you now have like full disk images, right, on these container um, platforms like Docker Hub. You can, well, you totally should not download random things from Docker Hub. But <laughs> 
you could. <laughs> and you can even have these image registries. We're, we're not only sharing configurations and configurations for multi-server, we're now sharing like actual disk images of things that you would actually deploy. So we're now doing operations open source in an open source way. So that's kind of where we are now. Um, where uh, I work a lot in the container space, um, and that's kind of where um, a lot of really exciting stuff is happening, where we're sharing a lot of this open source stuff. But it's not all rainbows and sunshine for me. Um, we've got this cloud out there. And this, I'm including like everything with that, like infrastructure as a service, um, platform as a service, software as a service, pretty much anything that is running on someone else's computer. Um, it sort of seems like cloud is this new proprietary in some ways. Um, one of the, some of the reasons we went to open source software was because we wanted security, we wanted to be able to fix our own bugs and, and write our own features, and we wanted control over things like data and services. We wanted to avoid vendor lock-in. Um, but something that I'm seeing now um, working at Mesosphere and working with customers who are building their platforms into, their, into these clouds um, is that they're using really vendor-specific tooling in all of these clouds. Um, I gave a talk at Comcast uh, last month, um, and Comcast is like the biggest cable company in the U.S. Um, and uh, I, was, I was talking to them about vendor lock-in, and they're like, oh man, our Amazon bills. <laughs> and I think this is a story familiar to many people, is they build into this cloud, and this cloud essentially is the new proprietary technology. Um, they no longer have things like control of their data um, in a way that, that is necessarily comfortable and they're suddenly getting vendor lock-in again. And I'm like, we learned all these lessons, guys. <laughs> Why are we building into these clouds again? So there was this really good quote from um, Edward Snowden who remoted into the OpenStack Summit um, about a year ago, um, the one in Boston in May. And he said, people mostly most people just consume the cloud without thinking. Uh, they're sinking costs into infrastructure that's not theirs. They're giving up, in data, giving up data and information about themselves without thinking. And I thought this was a really good quote for me, because I'm like, right? Like, you're just building this stuff into these clouds. You have no idea who's running them. You're spending a lot of money getting locked into these platforms. Um, and the worst part is that people aren't really thinking about it. They are just computers that are available for them to use in their business. And there's not a lot. And, and it's really easy. Um, I've seen so many proof of concepts go from developers just hacking on a few things and spending a few thousand dollars on a cloud platform to this going into production and their cloud costs ballooning and there's not been a lot of oversight. No one's really done an analysis to find out whether they should be building into this platform, what sort of business risks are there. So my call is to just sort of think about this. So I have a list of things we should think about when we start building into these clouds. Um, so the first one um, is whether the service you're building into is um, adhering to standards or are you locked in. Um, my favorite example of this is, of course, as a really strong open source person, it turns out I hate running email servers more than I love open source. <laughs> <laughs> so in 2007, 2009, I don't know, I switched over to Gmail, um, their hosted service. Um, and I felt really guilty about it, but I was like, I hate spam. I was doing this for my day job. I'm like, I don't want to ever look at great listing again. Um, and so I, I was really not liking email. Um, so I switched over to Google. And some of the things that went into my decision about this were, first of all, um, if I do get locked in, can I afford to pay Google to host my email? Um, probably. <laughs> I have a good job. I can probably pay them. Um, but the big one was whether they used open standards, and they happened to for Gmail. Um, so I, I'm able to run offline IMAP a few times a day to keep local backups. I'm able to access my mail through MUT still if I want to, um, which I did for a really long time, but uh, now I'm just lazy and I just use my phone through the snap. <laughs> but I can use MUT, and I can still like GPG sign my emails if I really want to. Um, and so in that case, they, they gave me open standards. So I'm able to move off of Gmail anytime I want. And that's really the first thing you want to be looking for if you start building into one of these proprietary infrastructures. Um, and I'm talking, as I said, like all of the as a services. So whether it's you're building against an API or you're building your entire infrastructure just um, on cloud technology that has proprietary bits in it. 
Um, the other thing you should think about is what your recourse is if the, if the company goes out of business. So I told that story about you know this insurance company who had this software that was um, the company went out of business and they got the source code. That's exciting, um, but that's it's even less likely these days with the cloud companies that you're building your stuff into. Um, your agreements typically do not include if we go bankrupt, you will get our source code. <laughs> if they go bankrupt, the service will turn off sometimes with no notice. And you've built your company into that, and that's a really bad spot to be in. Um, another thing is that some people will go with like the awesome new startup doing like, I don't know, like CICD or something, and they're like, ah, oh, I love this one because it's not their competitor. And then their competitor buys them and totally shuts down the service, and they're like, ah, oh, <laughs> now I'm back to the one I don't like. So you want to have a plan or some sort of recourse if this sort of thing happens. Um, you also want to look to see if the vendor has a history of communicating um, with their customers about things like downtime and security. So you want to look for um, post-mortems, um, maybe talk to some of their other customers. Um, this can be also done like by talking to their salespeople and getting them to talk to, um, putting them in touch with other customers. Um, but it's really important that they're honest about that because you really have no idea what's going on in a lot of these cloud technologies because it's really just so opaque. Um, you also want to know if the vendor responds to feature and bug requests. Like again, it's like the new proprietary. We're looking back again what we were doing 20 years ago. Um, and if you're a smaller company, can you build into this platform and still have them accept your feature requests or listen to your bug reports? Um, and this was one that a bunch of people don't really think a lot about is, is whether the vendor uses data in a way that you're not comfortable with. There's a lot of fine print when you build into these platforms. Um, your data can be used by these companies. Like sometimes they're just doing internal analysis. They're usually not selling it. Most of these companies are not malicious, but there are laws in all kinds of company in all kinds of countries about what you can do with customer data. Um, and it's something that you have to be really, really careful of when you build into these cloud platforms, um, because even if it is just like some developer. At, that at the cloud company, like hacking away at your data, they're like, I found this really awesome data set. I'm just going to play with it, because we're geeks, right? And we don't really think about whether we should. <laughs> so they you know, play around with your data, and suddenly you've got someone is using your data in a way that you're really not comfortable with, and you didn't think you agreed to. Or, and you may be breaking laws, because suddenly you're sharing your data with a third party that your customers didn't know about. Um, I sort of touched upon this as sort of about the initial costs. Um, but it can be really easy to put together this proof of concept and then have it go into production. Um, I have a, you know, there's all these consultancies now around like bringing down your cloud costs, um, and that's just because it's so easy to spend a lot of money, um, and a lot of money that your company is not prepared to spend um, when you start building into these platforms. Um, so it can be whether it, you're paying for a bunch of VMs or you're paying like a per seat license for like you're doing some sort of deployment work with your software, and suddenly it's you know the first 10, 10 are free, but once you get up to 100, suddenly you are spending really ridiculous amounts of money. So you want to get a handle on these, on these long-term costs. So I go through all of these because tons of companies go this route. Um, I mean, I've heard talks here this week already where companies were like, we can't spend the engineering effort. We just built into Amazon, and it's fine. Like, whatever. We're taking the risk. And that's perfectly fine. People do that all the time. That's great. Um, but I just want to implore you to actually think through all of these considerations um, and know that they exist. Like, you do have options. Um, and you can also look to open source. So I spent four years working on OpenStack, and I, I say it's certainly not for everyone. Um, but as, as a really basic like underlying infrastructure technology where you want to have a whole fleet of servers that you serve up as VMs, um, it's, it's really like the, the standard for open source these days. Um, you could also go into something that's more like a cluster uh, and container management. So I work on DCOS with Apache Mesos, but there's also Docker with Swarm and there's Kubernetes. And these are all services that you install like a whole fleet of servers. Um, the servers can be, um, they can be bare metal, so it could be just something in your data center. Or they could be on a cloud. So it could, you could be running Mesos on top of OpenStack. Um, you could be running Kubernetes on top of AWS. Um, but the point of these technologies is that you're not locking yourself in to this vendor's proprietary cloud and their tooling. You're running your own infrastructure on top of whatever they've got going on. 
Um, so if you want to run Apache Mesos, you can run it on the Google Cloud. And when that gets too expensive, um, you can do a migration into your own data center. Or you can migrate to Azure. Or you can migrate to AWS. And the point here is that you're not locking yourself into all of their secret sauce and all of their secret tooling. And you can move your infrastructure around. Um, and I like to say in this space, like these are the ones that are available today. Um, but Kubernetes is like taking the world by storm, and it's only three years old. Um, so I can see a lot of things growing in this space of infrastructure. And this is really where I see the future going, is these infrastructure projects um, that are open source, and you're able to move them, and you have this freedom of your data and your infrastructure. Um, so I just want to give you an example of like what you would see in a container infrastructure. So like at the bottom here, you've got like any infrastructure you want, right? Like as I say, like bare metal or any of these clouds. You've got something like Mesos or Kubernetes or whatever that does all of your orchestration of services and everything. And then all of your services get to live on top of that. So this is the bottom part is probably the proprietary bit, but you can swap that out however you want. The rest of this is just all open source. Um, so that you can move these top parts around to whatever platform you want on the bottom. Which is where I'll sort of conclude, and then I, I wanted to leave a bit of time for questions. I think I've got, no, actually I've got a little over 10 minutes. Um, but this is, this is where we sort of get into the space of hybrid cloud. Um, so one of the things that a lot of people I've been working with have been talking about is they don't want to depend on Amazon or Google or their on-premise premises um, deployment. They want all of them. So being able to move your workloads between these different um, clouds and bare metal and whatever else you're working on, um, it allows you to in-house parts of your in infrastructure if you need it um, for like data analysis or bandwidth is a problem or whatever. You can keep parts of your infrastructure in-house. You can offload some of it to the cloud. You can also burst to the cloud when you have extra, um, uh, uh, you need extra capacity. Um, and you can change things, like if the performance in, in one of the cloud providers is really not good, you can move to another one. Um, we have one, one customer who's, like, their developers are allowed to launch things on different clouds based on the pricing and um, how fast they are and, like, the, the, um, the characteristics of that cloud. So maybe one of them has, like, a back end with SSDs and they really want to run that for that workload. One of them offers, like, huge RAM allocations on their VMs and they want to use that. Um, so the developers are able to choose um, what kind of performance they're looking for in the application that they're deploying. Um, so they can choose like what um, is important to them and what they're running. Um, so hybrid cloud is sort of also this. This I mean, we've been talking about this for a while, um, but it's actually something that's becoming really real um, um, these days. So people have questions or stories. <laughs> Everyone wants to go to the break? <laughs> uh, I'll start in the back. Um, do hybrid cloud deployment actually, actually work? Because I mean, I've been on two and everyone just gets up and just puts everything in Amazon after <laughs> Yeah, so the question is whether hybrid clouds actually work um, or if everyone just gives up and goes to Amazon. Um, it, it depends on what, on what you're using. I mean, it's definitely something that's evolving, but like I know, you know, I. I work on Mesos, and it's something that's really a huge priority for us. Um, we've done some proof of concepts, and it actually does work. We do have a customer that is actually offloading to different clouds. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of work to be done in like, the automation of that and having it automatically go to separate clouds. Um, and, and there's also a lot of like, like, uh, implementation details that are a problem. Like Sometimes you can't automatically burst to a different cloud because they have different characteristics um, with regard to like um, the server sizes that they offer and um, their firewall rules are going to be different based on what cloud you deploy to. Like I know in Azure, they, they like block everything by default. Um, and I think the default firewalls and one of them blocks everything over like port 20,000 and I found out that the hard way. <laughs> um, but you know, it, it does work and it's definitely something that's like evolving very fast. Um, and we're, we're doing some demos in the Mesos community actually for the next DCOS release to actually show that off a bit more, which is pretty exciting. I'm, I'm like looking forward to it. Do we have one up front or, yeah. Um, I, I thought your slide on the different stand, looking for open standards um, was really good. I, you 
started is it started talking about you know, do they offer SNMP and um, sorry SMTP. SMTP. Yeah, yeah. So, so the question is is about um, I use I used email as an example of of something that has open standards, um, and that's when I switched to the platform. But it, speaking on an infrastructure level, like what's an example of that? Um, one of the things we're working in the container um, community is there's there's a few different um, standards that we're working towards. There's like the um, uh, the open container initiative where we want all the storage backends to be pretty much identical across whatever tech, you know, container technology you're using. Um, this can also be things like um, configurations. So um, a lot of the cloud proprietary cloud companies, they have their own deployment mechanisms um, for deploying to their cloud, but you also want to make sure that you can use something like Terraform without too much trouble. Like, can you plug in the credentials to your cloud and automatically build out a Terraform infrastructure rather than using their proprietary um, cloud tooling? Um, and then also, like, the standard stuff, like, can you just point your configuration management at it? Um, one of the things in the OpenStack community that we really, we, like, so the, the API is consistent across all of OpenStack, right? <laughs> like any OpenStack cloud, you just point to it, and that's the power of OpenStack. The API is the same. Um, it turns out it's actually not that simple because uh, companies who deploy OpenStack deploy different versions of the APIs. They deploy different um, services that are running on them. So one of the things you have to tease out is what standards are they using and how similar are they. So you can have two OpenStack clouds and be balancing between them, but which we did in the OpenStack infrastructure team. We did the CI testing for all of the workloads, or for all the, the software. OpenStack itself was developed and used a bunch of different OpenStack clouds to do the testing. Um, but we had this trouble where we would point it at one cloud and the test would run fine, and they didn't run very well in another cloud. Um, so sort of standards like that, like making sure that everything you're pointing to is you know, using similar APIs. Um, and I'm trying to think of like some of the other things, like infrastructure-wise, yeah, it's like configuration management, deployments. Um, and then data exportability, um, whether you're able to get out all of your data once you put it in, like is it it's spitting it out in some sort of SQL format that's going to be familiar to you, or is it just a blob of data that's going to be useless? Um, and this is a particularly important for like um, when people are doing data processing. Um, like people use Mesos a lot for um, streaming data processing, so data that's coming in and being automatically processed. Um, making sure that all the tooling that you're using for that is open source or has a format that you can export the final data to because you don't want to process all this data and then have it stuck in this proprietary cloud, really. So, yeah. All right. Thank you. <laughs>